welcome to our web conference uh, in, the de in December 2015. Uh, firstly, warm welcome from the, from the AOU Secretariat. Uh, it is uh, our first web conference this year, and we are very glad to have uh, Ishan, our old friend, to share with us an on an important topic. Uh, I'll leave the introduction to this part uh, to our facilitator, Dr. Yun. Uh, at the beginning of this session, I'd like to, uh, I hope you'll bear with me, for three minutes of commercials. Uh, I'd, as we have some new members, and I believe that some friends will, uh, will like to know more about uh, the Asian Association of Open Universities, AAOU. I'd like to give a very brief introduction here. Uh, AOU is a non-profit organization found in 1987. Uh, we have now 60-some members who are all high education institutions uh, with at least a big arm uh, in the area of open and distance education. And as members, we share a common belief that the development of distance education can be obtained through friendship and close exchanges, and it is what we members have been doing among ourselves. And it is, we believe that it is very useful for our open learning, higher education development. Uh, by working together, we believe we, uh, the, our association wishes to widen the educational opportunities available to all people in Asia uh, through distance teaching systems. We wish to improve the quality of educational institutions. We wish to develop the potentialities of ODL. Uh, we also wish to facilitate cooperation with other similar regional and international bodies. Uh, this is the part about our association, and I hope participants, if your institution has not joined the AOU, you uh, tell your organization about us and uh, all open and distance learning related institutions are welcome to join us. Uh, I'd like to spend a minute to introduce the, uh, our next uh, web conference. Uh, 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 not the next conference, it is about our coming grand event. That is our annual grand event uh, before we come to the next web conference. Uh, now, every year the AOU organizes uh, an annual conference uh, participated by hundreds of uh, distance education uh, administra administrators, faculty members, and also other specialists. Uh, this year it will be held on the 30th November to the 2nd of December in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it will be hosted by the Open University Malaysia. Malaysia. Uh, all are welcome, and we hope to see all participants there. It is our one of our major events, uh, and as an AOU members, uh, and for every one of our members, they enjoy a discounted registration rate in such events. And there are other benefits. We just call some examples here. Uh, our participants may enjoy uh, an exchange fellowship programs. Uh, if you go to our website, you'll see quite a number of fellowship programs. You can also get information through our newsletter and other things. Uh, you'll be able to participate in such kind of events, such as uh, web conferences. Uh, In the next month, we look forward to another web conference. That will be in the next web conference. Uh, that will be on OERU and the latest OER developments. Uh, that will be given by uh, one of the best persons uh, in this area, that is Dr. Ray McIntosh, who is the director of OERU and also uh, fun, uh, the direct director of OERU Foundation. And OERU U facilitator. Uh, he's also uh, the uh, the OERU chair of a number of organizations. We are very glad to have him. 
Uh, coming back to this time, we also very glad to have a very good speaker on this uh, timely subject. Uh, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. K. S. Yun, who is the director of the, our Educational Technology and Publishing Unit uh, in this university. Uh, as you are probably aware, the uh, presidency of the AAOU now resides at the Open University of Hong Kong. Uh, the Secretariat is with the Open University of Hong Kong. We are quite strong in a number of areas, and we are very glad to have Dr. Yun with us today as the facilitator. And I believe that he is one of the best person to uh, chair this section, uh, facilitate us in this section. Uh, over to you now, Dr. Yun. OK. Um, good afternoon to you, uh, participants. I'm really pleased to be the facilitator for um, the web conference today. Um, as you know, the topic for today's conference is jumpstarting mobile learning uh, through uh, DIY Android apps. And the best person to um, speak for us uh, would, of course, be Dr. Yishan Abewa Dana. Uh, Dr. Yishan, um, we know he's just received his PhD. Uh, but before that, let me tell you about the um, content of today's conference. Uh, he would like to introduce to us a comprehensive toolkit to, uh, which is developed by the Commonwealth of Learning for uh, higher education institution teachers to create their own Android apps and to use them in their teaching activities. Hopefully, students can then, uh, they can engage students in creating project apps for collaborative learning. Now, this toolkit will be released in the coming AAOU conference, Dr. Yishan said. So um, if you're attending the AAOU conference, you'll be the first one to receive the toolkits uh, at that time. Um, so this is the uh, conference. Um, I will just let you know the brief uh, rundown. Uh, after my introduction, then the presenter would uh, gave the conference, uh, would, would uh, give, deliver the presentation. After that, we have some time for questions and answers. We have totally about, uh, say, 15, uh, 50 minutes for the talk, plus questions and answers. Now, the house rules would be as follows. Um, with the agreement of um, Ishan, the whole conference session will be recorded. And the recording, uh, the video recording of it will be put on the AOU website under a Creative Commons license. That is, of course, um, all the content except those which would be, would, uh, Yishan would otherwise indicate to us. Now, all participants in this conference must follow the guidelines and the decision of, of the facilitator, i.e. myself. Now, all participants can raise your questions, but I'd like you to do so by typing uh, texts in the conference system throughout the session. So um, this is to avoid um, undue complications uh, through hand raising and other methods if you use the audio system. So in a way, you can only type your text, but you cannot speak uh, to the uh, uh, presenter for the conference. All right. So last but not least, of course, some description of the presenter. Dr. Yishan Abewadana is the director of the still the, still the director of the International Academic Relations Division, Open University of uh, Sri Lanka. I understand that uh, Yishan will be moving to another institution uh, very shortly. Uh, uh, Yishan is also was also former deputy dean and senior lecturer in IT at the School of Science and Technology at Wawasan Open University, Malaysia. Yishan holds professional memberships of MBCS, MIET, and MIEEE, and is a Microsoft certified professional. 
Um, he, as what I've said, he recently obtained his PhD in computer science at the University of Malaya. Uh, while the, his thesis is facilitated a uh, search of open educational resources using the desirability index. Um, uh, previous to that, Ishan has a master, has obtained a master uh, of science in engineering management in Bruno University, London. He's also got an MSc in Wireless Enterprise Business Systems, Bruno University, London. And uh, his uh, first degree is obtained in Bangalore University, uh, Computer Science. Um, so this is uh, our Dr. Ishan Abewadena. Without further ado, can I uh, move to uh, Dr. Ishan's talk? Uh, Ishan, please. Over to you, Ishan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Casey and Dr. KS, thank you for inviting me to deliver this uh, web conference, which is a prequel to the uh, coming AOU conference. Um, and also giving me the opportunity to speak on this particular topic, which I have been following for around a couple of years now. Um, you know, my previous work was mostly on uh, open educational resources, and this kind of ties in well with that aspect as well. I do also like to thank the Open University of Hong Kong, who, who uh, regularly do things like this, uh, innovative activities and disseminating knowledge to the AOU community, as well as I would like to thank the Asian Association of Open Universities uh, for their continuous uh, continuing effort uh, in terms of adding value to the uh, open university community uh, in the Asian region. Right, today I thought I'd, uh, I'd deliver a uh, small lecture, a brief lecture on uh, jump-starting mobile learning through do-it-yourself or DIY Android applications. Now, um, I was speaking to someone the other day. Um, she's actually a uh, advisor to the education minister in Qatar. And, um, you know, when she asked me uh, what I was doing these days in terms of research, I said, you know, I'm doing uh, research in uh, mobile technology. And she said, oh, I'm also doing the same. You know, I'm going into mobile learning. And, you know, we came to the conclusion that pretty much everyone's doing something in, uh, in something which has to do with mobile. Uh, these days because mobiles are pretty much part and parcel of our daily routines now and they are slowly making their way into the classroom. I mean for example one, one good example of a uh, mobile learning initiative is uh, the initiative by the Open University of Hong Kong you know where they, uh, where they converted uh, some of their material into uh, digital books and distribute through uh, uh, iPads and things like that you know it's a very very innovative um, innovative uh, approach. Um, however, you know, um, taking the cue from that, um, the the way the uh, Open University of Hong Kong went about it is to uh, get a outside party involved um, and to invest uh, some amount of money um, in terms of getting that uh, project, uh, or, you know, project up and running. Not all of us have that luxury, I guess. Um, and not all of us will be able to put down uh, a, an investment to create uh, applications for our teaching and learning. However, uh, I'm sure almost all of us, if not all of us, uh, want to incorporate uh, mobile technology and mobile learning into our day-to-day -day teaching and learning routine. So this particular presentation today uh, looks at how we can uh, do, it, do it ourselves how we can build applications, uh, full-blown, robust applications ourselves um, to facilitate mobile learning in our classrooms. Now, uh, the first question would be, oh, okay, he's going to talk about programming. Uh, actually not. I'm, 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 I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, some concepts uh, which anyone can do, anyone can use. Uh, without prior knowledge in um, uh, programming. You don't have to be a programmer whatsoever to uh, go about uh, building Android applications. And by the end of the lecture, you will learn how you can go about it and you can do more research on it. And I will tell you how you can uh, sharpen your skills in uh, Android app development as well. 
Now, if you look at this particular graphic, um, you know, it, it, it seems like the students these days are constantly overloading themselves or constantly plugged in uh, to, the, uh, to the web. And they're constantly streaming, they're constantly downloading, they're constantly reading, and they're getting high on information. Now, you can see the teacher who is uh, coming in with a cup of coffee and she gets uh, her buzz from the cup of coffee, whereas the student is getting her buzz uh, from her small smartphone and uh, listening to a, uh, watching a webcast on, on the smartphone. So the classroom uh, has become borderless. It has, uh, the, the walls have collapsed because you can uh, teach and you can learn um, anywhere. Now, for, uh, this, is, this web conference is a very good example. I, I'm sure many of you are from uh, all parts of the world. I am here in Sri Lanka, and uh, KS is there in Hong Kong. And you know, pretty much we are conducting a lecture uh, with slides and everything. So um, you know, walls are breaking down, and uh, it has become increasingly important to harness this potential that new technologies have brought in, especially mobile technologies. The, when you consider the modern teaching and learning scenario, when someone like me teaches a, uh, a student, uh, someone like the, the little girl in the, in the picture, I'm uh, from an age uh, where I, I didn't grow up with uh, digital technology. I wasn't born into digital technology. Digital, digital technology was just starting. I'm sure KS was the same. Uh, mm -hmm. However, these uh, small kids these days uh, are, are born into digital technology. That's why they are called the digital natives, if we may. However, the, the issue is um, these days the digital immigrants, uh, are people like you and me, uh, are te teaching these uh, digital natives. Um, so it's it's. It's pretty much like you know me going and learning a new technology and come and come in and teaching them how to do that. Whereas you know they are pretty much uh, you know used to it. Uh, you know it's like you know me going and learning how to play Angry Birds and teaching a small kid how to play Angry Birds. Whereas that kid has already mastered uh, several levels of Angry Birds by the time they are four or five. So um, you know that's that's the kind of situation we are in at the moment. So we need to, we need to, uh, we need to think beyond, and uh, which takes me to my next slide. Now we need to think how we can get through to these kids. Um, they find it really boring to go into a classroom, look at a chalkboard, and pay attention. Their their world is three dimensional. Their world world is tactile. Their world is graphical. Their world is filled with color. It's all about the user experience for them. It's it's not about just the visual. Um, or, or the user interface as such, you know, which we, which we used to call applications. It's, it's about touch, it's about feel, it's about vibration, it's about sound, uh, it's about video, uh, it's about audio. So all of those things um, are, uh, need to be incorporated into the modern day learning scenario. Now, um, one example I can give you is um, initially my, my, even now, my daughter uh, who is now five, five and a half, doesn't understand the concept of a keyboard. She, she, uh, when I open up my laptop, she's confused by the concept of a keyboard. She's asking why is there a keyboard on this laptop? Because she's used to the, con uh, the concept of an iPad, where the keyboard pops up. Um, and uh, also she, uh, on the screen, my, my screen is, uh, is not uh, touch sensitive, so uh, she goes in and you know, tries to touch icons to get into the application. However, that doesn't happen, and that kind of confuses her. This small touchpad over here, she, she's confused by what it does. You know, where, why, why is there a small arrow moving across the screen? Because for them, it's just touch, it's the pinch zoom, um, you know, and, uh, you know, swipe. So those are the kind of things they are used to. Now, us in our age, being digital immigrants, we are teaching our students who are digital natives using uh, obsolete technology. So we need to up ourselves as well. We need to retool ourselves and bring another dimension into the classroom where we can actually connect uh, with our our audience. So today we will try to look at uh, look at it a little bit and see how we can you know kind of do that. So the 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 the, the most logical thing any teacher would think is. Uh, Yes, okay, um, I need to go into mobile learning. So, you know, I have this great idea for an app. 
um, in in this particular case, you know, it's uh, it's about uh, you know learning about trees or whatever. So I have this really great idea for an app, um, and um, I I now need to incorporate that app into my teaching and learning. Uh, but you know the, the the problem is how do I go about building that app? Um, you know I don't have money, um, or I can get money, but I don't have the skills to develop it myself. So what would someone like that do? Uh, you know they'll try to get some money from the institution, or they will uh, put down some money uh, out of pocket and go to a bunch of geeks and uh, tell them to build the application for uh, 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 the teaching and learning purpose they will be using it. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, programming was like this. It's a bunch of geeks dressed in black, you know, with long hair and beards and things like that, uh, you know, sitting in a dark corner programming, right? You're writing code. And, you know, you, you tell them something and, you know, they write a bunch of code and it comes out really fantastic. Um, uh, but you know you have no clue how they did it. Um, that's why you know uh, I'm a programmer myself uh, uh, by profession, so you know that's why we get to make more money out of you. So anyway, uh, uh, th this is the this is the way you would go about getting your app created. You would go to uh, a software development company. You would go to a freelancer and tell them your vision, and uh, then get them to uh, build that application for you. Now what usually happens is. Um, you get stuck in the uh, software development life cycle because these programmers um, are, you know, living the software development life cycle on a uh, on a day, oh. day basis. They have the implementation, they have the testing, we have the uh, evolution, and the whole cycle repeats itself. So by the time uh, you you have a working app with you, you would have lost all your hair because you you would be pulling your hair out, uh, just trying to get them to understand your uh, vision for a for an application. So ultimately, it it becomes a very complicated affair. It goes through many cycles, and uh, you know people just tend to give up. If it's not done in a project manner, if it's just some individual teacher who wants an app created, uh, who goes to a software person and gets it done, then if it, it doesn't meet uh, the expectations, then uh, more, more often than not, uh, they will give up. Right? So um, this, this is particularly true for very senior teachers, uh, you know, who, who haven't really Got, uh, who don't have uh, the technical background to understand what the programmers would be saying. So they they just want they just want uh, um, an application built to teach their students, but the programmer is asking so many questions so that he can do his job. Uh, however, there's a miscommunication, and uh, ultimately, most of the time, it, it breaks down. So basically, this is a rough schematic of. Uh, or a rough flow of what will happen in a typical uh, M-Learning app development project. So uh, initially, uh, the institution or the individual uh, teacher recognizes the need for M-Learning. It's the way to go. Everyone's going down that route. So ultimately, uh, the mobile device will be the device everyone will be carrying around. Uh, books will become obsolete at some point because you know projects like KSS project or OUH case project uh, will uh, put all the books into an iPad. So you know what you need to take is an iPad with you or a tablet with you, not a physical uh, paper book. You know you, you're you're uh, uh, you're saving the trees in a way. So um, a, a must-have skill is for students to learn to use these things and uh, also for the uh, the teachers to get the students involved in using these things so it's in, there is initial excitement uh, there's most more, more often than not there's investment by the institution um, and then you go into the uh, app development process so when it goes into the app development process, you get the uh, complications which arise, arise from uh, requirement gathering, uh, the uh, the Chinese whispers which occur when your idea is communicated to the uh, developers, uh, and then constantly changing requirements. You know, you you um, you think that you know every day you can change your requirement because when you went to class today, you found out another cool. Feature feature which can be added into the application. So you keep on changing the requirement which delays the process and ultimately uh, you know <coughs> hinders the development. The next part is the delivery. Let's say you finally work it out with the uh, programmers 
and you have an actual working uh, first version uh, of an application. So uh, with a, as with any software application, more often than not, it will not meet the expectations and uh, you know it will not stick to the timeline. So uh, the time to market will not be there and you will be bringing the application into a classroom when th there might be a syllabus change or there might be a uh, change in uh, the pedagogy or whatever because these days you know these things um, change very fast. So when it comes to implementation on a wider scale, you know, there's frustration and, you know, abandonment, you know, okay, we did it, uh, it's a good pilot project, let's write a paper on it and let's continue on with the chalkboard um, and the PowerPoint slides. So that's pretty much how it will end. So um, taking that into consideration, what if you could build your own uh, mobile application? I mean, wouldn't that be great, you know, because um, as a teacher, I would know the subject matter. You know, this is what I teach day in and day out. I would know the level, you know, whether I'm teaching kindergarten or whether I'm teaching university, I would know the level. So I would know what kind of complexity to build into the application. Um, then the pedagogy, of course, you know, we, we have uh, all these pedagogical approaches which we use uh, when we teach in class. We know the assessments, we know whether it's a uh, MCQ, a multiple choice uh, question uh, assignment or whether you know it's a proctored exam at the end or whether we have quizzes, whether we have uh, presentations to assess uh, the uh, students in a sanitative and formative way. And we also know the implementation strategy, we know how to go about uh, implementing this in a classroom scenario where you know we we take all the students and break them up into groups or uh, you know we give them individual assignments uh, uh, things like that so we we already know what to do we we have a good idea of how to use the application it's just that we don't have the application and we don't have the uh, capability of developing it ourselves right so as a teacher i know best what my students need you know, again, the question is, but I don't know coding, so I, I, I can't build this application. So you give up and, you know, you, you kind of uh, make peace and move on. But uh, what I'm trying to say in this particular presentation is that there is a way that you can be actively involved in application development for mobile learning and teaching so that you can go to your students. And in fact, better yet, you can get them involved in, it, in the development as well. I'll tell you more about how to do that when we proceed into the next slides. Um, so to address this question of uh, do-it-yourself mobile applications, uh, MIT has come up with a um, platform called the MIT App Inventor. It's now in its uh, second uh, generation, uh, App Inventor 2. Initially, it started out as a standalone application which you downloaded and you could build applications on your device, on your, on your computer. Uh, now, it's, uh, it's um, moved on to the cloud and it's completely cloud-based. So you can uh, build your applications on the cloud and keep them there, store them there, and continue on with your application development whenever, wherever uh, you have a little bit of time. So it's really convenient. You can even continue your application development from a mobile phone or a tablet or, or a PC or a laptop. You know, you just need a stable internet connection. Now, in MIT, um, uh, the App Inventor project is uh, it's is going very strongly, and there are communities. Um, around the world teaching uh, students, teaching teachers um, how to build applications. Uh, it mainly concentrates on uh, education, community engagement, um, exploration, product development and research. But you know more emphasis is now put on uh, education because uh, that's pretty much where the, the impact is. Uh, if you are a commercial entity then obviously you have um, the resources to go to a software development company and get your application built. Um, so the, uh, the most impact uh, in terms of um, using um, Android applications would come from the education industry. You can read more about uh, App Inventor and how it started and you know um, how, how you can go about it from uh, appinventor.mit.edu. The URL is at the bottom there. So um, what, uh, uh, now you might be thinking, okay, uh, Ishan is going to speak about uh, programming again. Uh, um, no, actually um, the App Inventor platform uses a, a technique 
called uh, visual programming. Uh, if you are programmers out there, you might be familiar with visual programming, but this takes it to a whole new level. It, it's completely visual. Uh, there is no coding whatsoever. So it's, it's pretty much like uh, building a uh, jigsaw puzzle, putting pieces together um, and building something whole out of it. If you have, if you have the vision to, uh, if you have the vision for a uh, Android application or a mobile application, uh, then uh, you will be able to uh, drag pieces together and build it in a in a completely visual manner. I will show you how to do that uh, in the in the, uh, in the later slides. Uh, the platform, the web-based, the cloud-based platform uh, of App Inventor, is located at uh, ai2. Dot appinventor.mit.edu. The URL is available here. Once you go there, you can use your Gmail account to log in. You have to have a Gmail account to log in. And um, um, usually, it, it only works with the uh, Firefox uh, browser or the Google Chrome browser. Uh, in my opinion, because uh, App Inventor has uh, affiliations with uh, Google, um, it works better on uh, Google Chrome. Uh, it does not work on uh, Internet Explorer, so you have to keep that in mind if you want to uh, use uh, um, App Inventor. Um, App Inventor is an open source platform. Uh, it's free, so anyone can use it. And also, it goes on, it, it builds applications for the Android platform, uh, not the iOS platform. It builds applications for the Android platform. The Android platform is pretty much the dominant. Uh, uh, platform on the market at the moment. It, it has a large market share in terms of devices and uh, it's free and uh, it fits uh, many devices uh, seamlessly um, and uh, because of that um, you know App Inventor is concentrating on the um, Android platform. Now this is a this is a screenshot of the App Inventor interface. Now here I will just try to get the Pointer. Right. Um, so on on this side, there are three or four windows, right? So you have one here. This is the development area in the middle, and what you see here, the screen, is your your phone screen. This is actually the display area of your phone when you build an application. So now you can see that you can build it so in the way it it should look. Uh, on your mobile screen. Here is a list of the components and these are the properties. I will go into that uh, a little bit later. So this part, the first part is called the palette. The palette contains uh, all the components you can use in application development. I will go through uh, each of the components uh, in a later slide. Um, this is called the viewer. Um, uh, and as I said, it has the uh, phone screen over here. Um, so what you do is you actually drag these components and drop it inside. So let's say here I have a text box and a button. So I just have to go into the palette, click on the button, drag and drop it into the screen. And I have I can take a text box uh, and I can't see the text box. Uh, text box and drag and drop it onto the screen. That's all you have to do. Whereas if you did it using coding you will be writing a good 10-20 uh, lines of code to get that there. Right? Um, these are the properties. I will go into that uh, a bit later. Um, and at the top here, there are two buttons. One is designer view and the other one is the blocks view. So you have designer and blocks. This is the designer view. Right? The designer view, uh, has, uh, designer view allows you to build the application on a visual basic, um, uh, a visual basis. Um, so you will be building the interface uh, of the application here. Now, uh, what you need to remember, one thing you need to remember when uh, building uh, mobile applications is it's not, it's no longer just visual. Um, that's why the user interface concept has merged into the UX or user experience concept. Because uh, on a mobile phone, uh, you know you can you can uh, feel it vibrate. Uh, you can uh, you can you get um, aud audible alerts. You can see videos. You can see animations. Um, to uh, to to do a particular task, you don't have to click a button. Uh, sometimes you can just shake your sometimes you can just shake your mobile phone. Sometimes you can just shake your mobile phone. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Are you still able to see me? Uh, we have just lost. Are you, you still able to see me? Yeah, yeah. You are, you are back. No problem. Please go on, Ishan. Right. Mm. Uh, I, okay. um, sometimes, as I said, um, a device like this, uh, you can just uh, shake uh, to um, make it do something, um, um, rather than you know uh, taking it and pressing buttons on the screen. Um, and also to give an alert, it could vibrate. Uh, it could vibrate um, rather than uh, you know making a noise. So you know all of those things can be incorporated into your application development. Now, um, the the blocks, the blocks part here. The, the blocks editor here uh, is where you build the actual application logic, right? So I will go into the blocks editor now. So this is the this is the blocks editor. This is the blocks editor. Now again, you have a couple of panes. You have one pane on the uh, on uh, on to your left here, which contains a set of blocks. Now these blocks are used to build the application logic. Uh, what a uh, programmer would usually do using uh, lines of code, you will be, uh, you will be, um, you will be, you can do through a drag and drop exercise uh, in terms of blocks. Now, um, in the uh, <coughs> in the drawer here, this is called the drawer. You have uh, built-in blocks, uh, which are uh, you know components you can use. Um, you can use readily uh, in your application uh, development as well as uh, component specific drawers. So let's say for example you have a text box or a uh, button then you will have uh, logic blocks uh, here which uh, correspond to those particular uh, components. Now this area, the white area you see in the middle is the viewer where you actually build your logic. Now here you see a logic block. This is a logic block. We will look at how to create this logic block later on. But what you need to understand at the moment is there are two major components. You have the designer and then you have the blocks uh, editor uh, where, where you build the user interface or the user experience as well as the logic behind it. Yes, are you still able to see me? Yeah. Now, uh, another really um, cool aspect of App Inventor is it 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 allows you to it allows you to develop um, or it allows you to do um, live testing. Now, usually, um, uh, pro programmatically, you can do that as well. Uh, but here, because you are not using programming, um, App Inventor has the facility to pair up with a actual device. Now let's say you have a mobile phone, an Android mobile phone. You can pair up with uh, App Inventor, the App Inventor platform. Um, and uh, when you're building your application, it will show up on your phone screen, right? So when you're building the application, uh, once you drag and drop something, it will actually show it to you on the screen. So you have a visual representation of what is going to happen immediately. So you, when you're building the application, you no longer have to guess because you will see how it looks on the phone screen immediately. Also, you will be able to uh, make use of the functionality immediately. Let's say, for example, when you press a button, uh, if it has to uh, uh, say something, uh, when you press a button, it says hello. Then once you build the, uh, build the logic, uh, as soon as you build it, you can, you'll be able to press that button, and it will say hello. So that's called live testing. Um, there are three methods of uh, doing live testing. The first one is with Wi-Fi um, and a mobile device. Mm. If your um, laptop or your computer which you are using to uh, uh, build the application or using uh, for the accessing AI2 platform, you can connect uh, your mobile device via Wi-Fi to the AI2 platform. So that's completely wireless. Um, as soon as you make the changes on the App Inventor platform, it shows up on your on your mobile device, right? The second way is to use a, um, a USB cable. 
Um, however, this is a bit tricky because you will have to have device drivers. It's not recommended that you use the USB cable. It's always recommended that you use the Wi-Fi, but if you know all fails, then uh, using a USB is a good option as well. Now, the third way of doing it, the, here it says option two, uh, but the third way of doing it would be to use the built-in emulator. Now, if you are getting your your students involved, if you are getting your whole class involved in the development, uh, the whole class might not have uh, you know mobile devices with them, and also sometimes the school network might be blocking Wi-Fi or you know might be blocking the App Inventor platform. So in that case, you you can use the uh, built-in emulator uh, of App Inventor. Now this is the emulator which is available on App Inventor. It's a it's a virtual phone. Uh, on your computer. It acts ex exactly like an Android phone. It runs the same operating system as an Android phone, but it's a piece of software um, on your computer. Once you connect uh, the App Inventor platform to the emulator, you will be able to do, you will be able to uh, build uh, and do live testing uh, on the emulator itself without actually having an Android device. And later on, you can download the device uh, to or download the application um, onto your computer, oh, sorry, onto your mobile device. <coughs> now, going into the uh, basic components, going into the basic components um, of uh, of user experience design. So you have user interface components here, and as you can see over here, you have buttons, text boxes, list views. Date time pickers, check boxes, labels, list pickers, sliders, password text box. Uh, this is a pop up notifier, um, image, uh, web viewer to go on to HTML websites, uh, and a spinner, you know, the kind of thing you get when you're setting your alarm, um, uh, or, you know, the kind of thing you get when you're, I mean, you're referring to a date on your mobile device. So you get all of these components as basic components which you can. Just drag and drop onto the uh, the designer and build your Android application. No, uh, there's a quick question uh, I need to answer. The the App Inventor is only meant for Android. Uh, the justification is you know it's open source, just like the Android uh, platform, and it has affiliations with Google, um, so uh, it it goes into um, uh, Android. So we are talking about uh, only Android application development. So you'll have to have a Android device uh, to uh, do live testing. Um, now uh, the second one is uh, uh, is the media. Uh, the second one is the media. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the, just a quick uh, comment. Uh, you can keep on adding the questions. KS will compile them, and we have a Q and A session later on. And uh, you know, uh, I think I'll be able to answer some of your questions later on. Now, coming back to the media, uh, you have the player. This is a media player where you can play sound clips, video clips, and then also there's a sound component uh, which is used to play, uh, explicitly play uh, sound clips, um, and a text to speech engine uh, which uh, you can use to uh, speak out uh, certain parts, I mean, speak out text. So basically, if you have a book, uh, you can get your application to read it out uh, to your student, and you can tweak the voices, uh, you can tweak the accents and things like that. All of those things are possible uh, with the text to speech. Uh, it also uh, it's also something which you can use if you're if you're thinking about accessibility. You know, building application for the applications for the impaired. Um, so um, those aspects are there. Yandex Translate is a uh, is a component which uses uh, a external service uh, to translate uh, one language into the other. Actually, uh, you have the video player uh, to play that video. Uh, the camcorder, uh, which accesses uh, the uh, camcorder on your mobile device, and you can record video. Uh, there's a camera. Uh, there's a camera which ca you can use to capture uh, photographs. Then there's the speech recognizer. The speech recognizer actually works quite well. Uh, it works quite well. Um, uh, it it uh, you can continuously speak into the speech recognizer, which will uh, type in the text you're speaking, 
uh, again uh, you can use that for if you're building application for people with impairments uh, image picker is um, you know when you for example if you're using Facebook and you're uploading an image uh, when you click on photo it will give you a whole list of photos which are available on your device so the image picker works the same way it will give you a, a list of uh, images available on your device and you can pick the ones you want um, then sound recorder again you know it, it does what it, it says on the tin it records sound you can use it as a, uh, a, a sound recorder uh, to record you know interviews or whatever you want um, drawing is uh, is going into graphics and animation the canvas is the base template upon which you will be building um, uh, games and animations and uh, you know things like that uh, an image sprite is one of the fundamental components of drawing and animation. The image sprite can hold a, a uh, photograph or an image inside it. So let's say, for example, you ha you want to have a uh, uh, have a game uh, where you shoot balloons. So you can have multiple image sprites with uh, images of balloons, right? And uh, then uh, you will need a uh, image of a of a gun uh, to shoot the balloons. That will be another image sprite, which will hold the image of the gun, right? So you know you can imagine how uh, you can build an application with that. Uh, the ball is again another component. Uh, it's it's exact. It behaves exactly like a ball uh, on your screen. So when you're going into uh, building a let's say a game again, uh, if you're going into building a brick game or, or breaking the bricks game, you can have a bunch of bricks at the top, and you can use this ball to break the bricks, right? You know things like that. So you can uh, you can experiment and uh, see you know how creative you, you can get with it. Now, if you go into the advanced components, there are there are uh, a bunch of components uh, which can do a lot of serious stuff. Now you you get sensors. The first one is a is a clock, um, uh, you know which which is a ticker. So you can set it, and each time uh, it fire each time a certain amount of time is elapsed. It will fire. For example, if you set the ticker to one second, then each second it will fire an event, and you can get uh, you can do something uh, when that event fires. You have a barcode scanner. This is a 3D barcode scanner uh, or QR code scanner. So you, uh, these are used very commonly these days. So you can use that location sensor that actually identifies exactly where you are using GPS. Orientation sensor whether the uh, whether the uh, phone is uh, portrait or landscape or uh, in between, you can use that to build a compass. Um, a near field sensor, uh, NFC. If your if your phone has uh, NFC, then you can use the uh, near field component to build applications in that sense. Accelerometer sensor sensors whether your your phone is moving. So uh, you know if you if you shake your phone to do something. Uh, then you use the accelerometer sensor to see whether it's shaking. Proximity sensor, when you put your phone to your ear, these days the uh, display switches off. So it detects that it's in close proximity to your, to your ear. So the proximity sensor um, allows you to, uh, to get the value of the proximity between uh, the phone and the uh, next object. Social, you have emails, you have texting, uh, you have phone calls and phone numbers. Sharing is what you do. You have, um, you know, whichever social media installed on your device can be accessed through sharing. So uh, if you have a, uh, let's say you have built a application for your class where you do, uh, um, where you know the the, the 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 students have to go out and uh, take photographs of uh, animals and uh, write a small description about that animal. And share it with the with the network. Now this this could be a small app for a for a uh, for a classroom. So um, this app is downloaded onto the student's mobile phone. You take them on a road trip to the zoo. You ask them to uh, go and uh, take a photograph uh, of whichever animal and uh, write a small description about it, and then share it with your friends. Right. So um, you can do it instantly. So that application will be a community or a communal learning experience uh, for your students. Of course, you can access the Twitter feed. You can tweet. 
you can have a closed tweet so basically you can have a Twitter going on or a tweet going on in your uh, within your classroom um, and uh, you know you can have a constant discussion um, uh, going on in the uh, in the classroom um, contact picker is to pick a contact from your phone uh, phone's database Going into more advanced stuff, we have storage, we have um, uh, fusion tables, we have flat files. Uh, this is a tiny web DB where you can store information on the web to be accessed by the uh, application. And we have tiny DB. Uh, that is uh, a small database within the persistent memory of your uh, mobile device. And so you know you can you can actually store information um, in in the device itself. For example. Um, if you're building a uh, a game, or, or if you're building a quiz app, uh, where the students have to answer uh, a certain number of MCQ questions, um, you know when a student answer, uh, when a student answers a question correctly, uh, the application should remember that it has uh, uh, the student has answered the question correctly, so that the next time the student opens up the application, it will not start from uh, the the first question. It will actually remember which questions have been answered. So to do that, you have to store some information inside the persistent memory of the uh, mobile device. So that you can do using a tiny DB. Um, and then connectivity, you have Bluetooth client, Bluetooth server. You can uh, make your phone a client or a server in terms of Bluetooth. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is for web services. You can actually access a web service which is already out there. Uh, to do a certain thing uh, or, or a certain number of things, giving you an example, uh, if your institution or if, or if your yeah if your institution has a uh, web service which updates the uh, uh, updates the exam schedule, then you can build a small application which will access that uh, web service and the exam schedules will be automatically displayed to the students with any update. Activity starter is a very important component. Using the activity starter from within your application, you can uh, access any other application on installed on your mobile device or any other um, uh, physical component like the camera or the speaker or the microphone using the activity starter. So uh, within um, App Inventor, you get you know all of these components, built-in components, which allows you to build uh, pretty robust applications. Now, if you uh, if you're into uh, engineering, mechatronics, electronics, I'm sure you've uh, you've seen the Lego uh, Mindstorms kit, which is a very complex uh, robotics kit. You can do a lot of things with it. A lot of sensors are available, uh, and uh, App Inventor supports the uh, Lego Mindstorms. So you can actually build an application and control your Lego Mindstorms robot. Uh, from an application itself, and you can get feedback uh, from the uh, from the robot, uh, whether it's visual or whether it's uh, whether it's proximity. You can actually get feedback and display it on the mobile app itself. So it's it's pretty powerful in that in that sense. Now this is looking at how to build an application. I'm, I'm aware of the time. Uh, I'll, I'll go a little bit uh, faster. Uh, uh, just to give you a, an example of uh, how to build an app, uh, here you have an image of a uh, kitty cat, and uh, this is of course using a uh, image component, right? And then there is a label underneath says uh, which says pet the kitty. So what you need to do to add that label is to drag the label component from uh, the drawer and put it inside. Uh, the the screen over here, so it'll it'll come down here, and then to change the word to pet the kitty and also change the change the color, you go into the properties pane, you click on the component, you go into the properties pane, and then you can change the properties of that particular component. So here, the background color is changed to blue, the font size is changed to 30, the text is changed to pet the kitty. The text is what appears inside the label. And the text color is changed to yellow. So there are some other uh, uh, properties as well. Depending on the on the component, the, the properties will change. So each component will have uh, various properties that you can change during your application development. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the block. This is the block. 
now uh, we, we you've seen how the blocks editor works so uh, similarly you can uh, you can click on the sound here uh, or you can click on the button which will have this particular block you can drag and drop it uh, into the uh, blocks editor and then you can uh, click on the sound and drag and drop this block and put it inside now you can see that this the the uh, brown color block over here has a small notch right and the purple color uh, box over here has a small groove so it fits in perfectly um, as a as a building block now if you look at this particular the green uh, block over here it doesn't have uh, that groove and it has a it has another notch in front so that component will that block will not fit in uh, this particular block so it's it's basically like building a jigsaw puzzle you know um, uh, taking fitting blocks together and uh, building your logic i'll talk about how to build the logic in the the next slide mm. right now contrary to traditional programming uh, building uh, logic in app inventor is extremely easy now uh, le let's take this scenario okay uh, this is the requirement this is my requirement this is my application i have a text box inside uh, I have a speak button and then I have a text to speech uh, component which uh, converts whatever text into a, 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 um, a, a audio into a sound it will speak it out right so my requirement this is how this is how I would explain my requirement this is how you would go and explain your requirement to a programmer right if you were to hire a programmer uh, so you will go and say okay when the uh, the user will enter some text into the text box right so that's basically what this is the user will enter some text into the text box when the uh, when when the speak button is clicked when the speak button is clicked the app will speak out the text the user has entered that's how you will uh, you know tell the programmer what to do you know uh, i want you to build an application where there's a text box and a speak button and when the user enters some text into the text box and clicks on the speak button uh, it it speaks it out right you know that's that's what you will tell uh, the uh, the program now traditionally they would go and do a lot of coding to build that logic for you right however you in in app inventor uh, you can build that logic now you just need to think um, you just need to convert the requirement into a a logic statement now here what i've done is i've converted or the requirement the uh, the lay explanation of what i want to do into a bit more structured uh, logical sentence when button 1 this is button 1 right this is button 1 when button 1 is clicked the text to speech 1 that is the text to speech component over here reads the text reads the text the text which goes in here inside text box 1 the text inside text box 1 as the message and speaks it out right so you have button 1 you have clicked you have text to speech 1 you have text text box 1 message and speaks okay so you basically you basically built your logic you you built an app which could take textual input from a user and then speak it out if you went um, to a programmer with that requirement i am pretty sure they will charge you a bomb now here you can do this in under 5 minutes you can build an app to do that in under 5 minutes on app inventor so now that you have uh, written the logic statement uh, this way you will build the uh, the logic block this is called a logic block now the first first uh, logic block is the button button 1 dot click logic block so when button 1 is clicked so i have to go and find the when button 1 dot click do something so this is what this block says when you click on button 1 do something right so that's the first block i will look at okay once i found it then it says uh, text to speech 1 uh, reads out the text inside the text inside text box 1 as the message and speaks it out so then i have to go and say okay uh, when the button is clicked the text to speech engine has to do something so i have to go into the text to speech and find this block see again the the uh, notch and the groove fits very well it says call text to speech 1 dot speak so text to speech 1 will speak a message see this is the message and the message is the text 
which has been put inside the text box. Mm. So you will go and find the block which says textbox one dot text. Now, uh, how easy was that? You know, you, you take a, a requirement like this, a requirement statement like this, make it into a, a logic statement, and then you can go ahead and build your application. It's as simple as that. And if you have live testing uh, set up, then as soon as you put this last block into place, you can test it on your mobile phone. You can uh, punch in a, a, a text like uh, hello world or hello KSUN and then it will speak it out. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's as easy as that. So, uh, now you can see the power of do-it-yourself uh, applications uh, using the, the App Inventor platform. Right, moving on, this is one example. Um, this, is a, uh, this is an application which allows you to do virtual uh, chemistry experiments. So this is water, right? This is a beaker of water. And uh, then you have some metals over here. And uh, it, it actually allows the user to drag and drop each of these metals into the water to see what happens, right? So, uh, you know, if you, if you take copper and put it in, nothing will happen, right? You can drop copper into the water and nothing happens. Yes. Uh, then you can take uh, potassium or sodium and put it into the beaker and explosion, right? So this, this will actually display, this will change and it will display an image of uh, the reaction. So you can become uh, a bit more creative and you can, uh, you can play a video when you put sodium into the water, as soon as the sodium hits the water, it displays a video of uh, the, re the chemical reaction from YouTube. So students actually can do these experiments on a mobile device. You know, they will have, I mean, obviously they will not have the same impact as, you know, going and, you know, uh, taking sodium and putting it uh, into the water inside the laboratory. However, you know, perhaps during their revision or perhaps when, you know, uh, they want to re uh, do homework, they can actually use this app and, uh, you know, dump certain elements into water and see what happens, you know, without getting their eyes blown out and uh, their fingers burnt so, um, and killing the cat. So, um, you know, this is one example. Okay. Here's another example. Now, this is a, this is a application. This is a, a, a bit of a complex application. Uh, it's called, uh, this one is called voice notes. So what it basically allows the student to do is to take uh, auditory notes during their revision. Let's say if they are studying a particular book chapter, it will allow them to just click on the record button here. Click, uh, let me just get the point. Click on the record button over here, and then it will go into the recorder. You can actually take a note. Okay, um, uh, the, uh, the theory of relativity is actually this, although it, it is uh, explained as gibberish in my textbook. Um, or uh, you can say, Okay, E equals to MC squared, and C is the, the speed of light, um, and put it in as a uh, audio note. So you can, you can actually have a chapter uh, or a page or a chapter reference. So you can say, um, uh, when you go into saving, when you go into saving over here, you can actually save the note. And you can put in a chapter reference. You can put in a page reference. So the next time you revise, uh, you, you don't have to take notes on your uh, textbook itself. You actually have an audio note explaining what you have learned in your own words. So when you're revising, when you're on the bus, when you're on the train, uh, you can actually put up a, a pair of headphones and go through all the notes that you have taken uh, while you were revising. So it allows you to record. It allows you to play back. It allows you to delete if you don't like it. Uh, it allows you to save it uh, if you like it then it, it gives you a list of the recordings you have and you can play it back at any time. So this is, a, this is done without a single piece of code, uh, completely through visual programming on the App Inventor platform. And it's, pretty, and it's a pretty powerful uh, application. You can, uh, I, I think uh, it's available as uh, shout notes on uh, Google Play. If you want to have a go with it, you can download it from Google Play. It's called shout notes. Um, now, going into the actual application development process, you can get your students involved because ultimately they are your stakeholders, they are your customers. If you're building applications, you shouldn't be just building applications for yourself. 
you should get the students um, involved in your application development. Now, traditionally, you couldn't get them involved because you know you would be going to a, a programmer, and you know the programmer will be doing everything. Then you will get your application back, and then you will uh, implement it. However, using the App Inventor platform, you can get your students involved. There are there are there are ways of exporting the project file. So you can once you have a base application, uh, you can export that uh, as a .aia file. Uh, and you can uh, email it to your students, you can put it up on your web server so that the students can download it and import it onto their App Inventor platform and build from there, right? So uh, that's one aspect. It could be a creative project, uh, it could be uh, enhancements, um, and it could be collaborative development of an application uh, which they will be using inside the classroom, right? Also, if you now, this is this is a, a, a one of the workshops um, I conducted. This was conducted uh, in um, March, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's March in India. And uh, these are not students, but they were my students on that day. These are teachers, and uh, it was a, a train the trainer uh, workshop, uh, three days, where I actually trained. Uh, these teachers um, to use the App Inventor platform and they went on to uh, teach their students how to use uh, App Inventor and also to build collaborative uh, applications in their classroom. Um, so what I was trying to say is uh, if you once you have developed the application <clears throat> let's say for example you have developed the, the virtual chemistry experiments application and you want all of your students to have that application, uh, rather than uh, putting it up on Google Play, uh, you can actually uh, download the uh, <coughs> download the .apk file and email it to your students so that they can access it from their mobile devices, which will automatically install it on their mobile phone. Or you can have a you can uh, generate a QR code, a 3D barcode like this. And the students can use their QR code reader on their phone um, to read the barcode, and it will automatically download the application from the App Inventor uh, um, platform and install it on their computer or on their mobile device. So distribution of your application becomes extremely easy uh, uh, when it comes to App Inventor. No more compiling because you know compiling is done by them. You don't see the source code, um, and you don't need to worry about the source code because everything is done um, done for you by the App Inventor platform. You just have to click a few buttons. Mm -hmm. the, the other way is once you have fine-tuned all, uh, all of your aspects inside your application, you can upload it onto Google Play so that you know, anyone can use it, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just your students. Uh, Google Play, allow, uh, they, you can upload it through uh, the Google Play developer console. Uh, to upload applications onto Google Play, you have to pay a lifetime or a one-time fee of 25 US dollars. Uh, and uh, once you do that, you can uh, upload as many applications as you want uh, onto uh, Google Play. Um, and one, uh, you know, when you upload, there's a whole process of uploading applications onto Google Play. There are, uh, you know, many checkpoints you you need to uh, you need to follow. And uh, one of the things Google will look at is when you upload your .apk file onto Google Play, it will look for compliance because Google has, uh, you know, these compliance standards. And when you are coding, when you are programming, if you don't stick to these compliance standards, uh, it will it will throw it back at you and say, okay, please go and uh, you know revise the application. However, on App Inventor, because it's working very closely with Google, when you build your app application, it's 99.9 percent .9 correct according to Google standards. So you will have uh, next to none uh, problems when it comes to uploading uh, applications onto Google Play, right? Mm. All right, so that brings me to, I think, my last slide. I think I've done OK with respect to time. Mm. Um, yes, um, Kay has mentioned a little bit about the Educational App Development Toolkit for teachers and learners. Um, I, I wrote this uh, toolkit. It's a it's a comprehensive book of around uh, 300 400 pages. Um, uh, it's it's uh, it's meant to introduce uh, the whole App Inventor platform and developing uh, applications on the App Inventor platform uh, 
for you know teaching and learning purposes. It was edited by Dr. Sanjay Mishra of the Commonwealth of Learning. It's currently in press and uh, hopefully by the AOU conference um, it will be ready so that you can you can have a go at it. Now in the uh, in the toolkit, you know you you get an introduction into App Inventor, the developer environment, how to do live testing. Uh, it details out how you connect to your device through Wi-Fi, through USB, or to the emulator. Um, and uh, you know, uh, then setting up your device for actual development and debugging and things like that. All the technical details I explained uh, in in uh, very layperson terms uh, in in the in the introduction section. Then we have activities and tutorials. There are seven activities. Which, uh, which uh, basically seven apps which you will build um, using uh, many of the components I, I uh, mentioned earlier on. Then there are six tutorials, and these are intermediate apps. You will be using a lot of components. I mean, you saw the virtual chemistry experiments. Uh, uh, you, you saw the virtual chemistry experiments uh, application, and uh, that application is also. Uh, included in the tutorials. You saw the voice note application. That application is also there in the tutorials. Um, then it will uh, it'll talk to you about uh, packaging and distribution, how to package your application, um, how to email it, how to uh, come up with the .apk file, how to upload it onto Google Play. And now publishing apps on Google Play is a separate chapter. You, you will learn how to publish it, how to set the particular parameters that you need to set on Google Play before you publish it. And also, if you want to go on to uh, teach your students or you know train other staff on uh, this particular platform, then it, it has a guideline for conducting uh, the App Inventor workshop as well. Um, and uh, finally, uh, a list of useful resources uh, which you will be using in your application development. So I think um, that's all I have for you in this one hour. So um, I will stop by saying happy app development and uh, hand it back to you, KS, mm -hmm. to uh, go into the Q&A session. Um, okay, well then, Yishan. Um, well, you're a little bit off time, but uh, it's all very much welcome. Uh, you've given us some um, general idea of how we can um, do apps development uh, like a, um, a, a novice uh, person. And you have also given us uh, some very good examples of how we can uh, develop interesting apps uh, for use. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I would like you to answer some specific questions. Well, there are still more to come as participants are just uh, sort of finished um, listening to what you say. Um, I've got a couple uh, first, if you can answer them here. The first is uh, by Dr. Rajesh uh, of, um, is it uh, BOU or IGNU? He said, um, can such uh, app in, uh, in, what is it, in best uh, app application be plugged in as in Moodle? Can, can you accept things like plug in as in Moodle? I don't understand as much, but can you answer this one first? This is, okay, I uh, think I think uh, I think he's he's referring to uh, this application being used within Moodle, uh, if I'm not mistaken, oh, okay. uh, as a plugin. There's, yeah. There is no such plugin at the moment. It's a standalone platform. <coughs> However, you can always build an application which allows students to access your Moodle account uh, from their mobile phones or from their uh, uh, you know from a particular mobile application. Let's say you have a learning management system on Moodle, and uh, you know most of the students, uh, you know, are reluctant to go into the learning management system, except when there is a test or an exam. So uh, you can actually build an app uh, which listens to uh, the learning management system and brings in information or uh, you know useful updates uh, or news and things like that onto a student's phone because they will be constantly on their phone and if they see an alert if they see an alert saying okay the uh, the lecturer has uh, posted something in the forum 
uh, they might be interested and they might go into the uh, forum and start interacting. Uh, better yet, you can actually build an app uh, where they can um, they can respond immediately via a Twitter feed or via text message and that will be reflected in the learning management system so the discussion can happen uh, the discussion can, ha can happen uh, from anywhere so people will be using the application to you know uh, participate in the discussion and uh, Moodle will be keeping a record of the discussion so you can build uh, this kind of these kind of applications uh, using App Inventor I hope that um, answered your question okay all right um Actually, I have a question myself, but you seem to have answered it during the process. And that is, um, with all the um, uh, promises of uh, such application, what are some very interesting examples of making good use of um, simple applications like what you've just said in, in general teaching? Uh, you've, you've, you've given us some very good examples like the chemistry experiment. Uh, and so forth. Do you have um, any more examples to show us, Ishan? Well, there are many more examples in the uh, in the toolkit. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, these example uh, examples with me uh, so that I can show it to you. Okay. But once the toolkit comes out, it will come out as a uh, OER and it will be freely available. All okay. the all the applications are also there. The project files as well as the uh, .apk files, which you can use to uh, you can use to uh, install the application on your device. All of those are there, and uh, you know you can uh, have a look at it. Basically, what what uh, App Inventor does is it, it lets you be creative, um, and uh, you know you can identify a need uh, in your teaching and learning, and go ahead and build that application. Um, even even if you don't build the full application, let's say you want to get a company or a software developer to build the full application, you can quickly come up with a prototype. Uh, to show them so that they better understand what exactly your needs are and the kind of look and feel uh, you, you you require. So you know, uh, uh, for that this this particular platform becomes quite useful. Mm, good. Um, if I may follow on with the chat um, that's just gone through us, uh, there's another question about the suggested bandwidth for the application. I suppose that would mean in the development process you communicate between your 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 phone and the system is that right uh, can you answer the question ishan is the suggested yeah, yeah, the, 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 i mean app inventor yes app inventor is developed in a very uh, light manner so okay. uh, it's it's not uh, resource heavy at all uh, with a good 3g connection you should be able to uh, build develop your applications uh, it's recommended if you have a uh, LAN or wired internet connection, a good uh, ADSL would be, you know, great, you know, so you don't have interruptions. However, uh, a basic 3G uh, would do without any problem. And, you know, it, it's it's also not, uh, you know, download heavy. So, you know, it doesn't download anything on it, onto your computer and there are no uploads going on. So, uh, you know, a, a little bit of data goes a long way when you are developing on the web, on the cloud itself. Um, and also, because it's on the cloud, it, it's automatically saved on the cloud. Uh, you don't have to keep on uh, pressing save because it will automatically save in the background every couple of minutes. Even if you get disconnected, it doesn't matter. You can come back. Uh, and once you get the connection up again, you can go back and you know continue on from uh, you know where you stopped. Um, so you know it's it's built in that way so that uh, you know you, your your work doesn't get lost uh, at any given any given time. I see. Uh, this is a related question about the number of learners logging in at the time. I suppose it's about downloading the app. I do not understand this part. Can you um, take a look and under answer this question, Ishan? Uh, Dr. Rajesh asked about okay, the I, number. I, I think. I think. I, I think. Um, it, it's it's unlimited users because each user will be using their own uh, their own login details. So each user will have their own App Inventor account uh, to build applications. Um, because of that, you know there are unlimited number of users. You know you can, you know your whole class can go on to App Inventor and develop there. Uh, if you are asking about uh, downloading the application, again there is no limit. Uh, you know it all depends on how you distribute your application. 
because if you put it on Google Play, it's available to the whole world. Uh, yeah. If you if you download the .apk file and email it to your students, it's it, you know it's basically within your students. Um, if you do the if you build the or if you uh, get a inventor to build the um, 3D QR code and ask your students to scan it and download the application, they can only do it then and there, you know, because uh, the QR code will not be available to them afterwards. So you know, it all depends on you know how you go about implementing. Uh, the the application in your context. Okay, so it depends on how you want to distribute the application that you have developed. But as what you have said, application yeah. itself is not a large size program, right? Normally, it's, it's not. It's not, large, uh, not you know, most of the time, you 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 cannot you cannot build applications more than five MB. So uh -huh. you know, these applications would be quite oh. small, less than five MB. Um, and you know Google uh, has a, a again a, a standard which says you know uh, the applications cannot be uh, more than 5 MB. Um, so you cannot cram in a lot of images and things like that inside. And even if you are using background images or whatever, you will have to uh, scale them down so that the size is small. Uh, 5 MB is complete in total. You know your code, your uh, resources, your sounds, and everything. So uh, you know you have to be within that uh, constraint when you are building the application. Okay. There's another question by uh, N. Balagan, uh, who said that, who asked about can it be automatically must be updating the services from the institutional website? Uh, I don't understand this part. Can you answer, Ishan? Okay, I, uh, I perhaps um, he is asking about the the version of the application. So whether you know the application can be automatically downloaded to the uh, to the user's mobile device uh, when there is a new update. Um, okay. So if you are doing it from the institutional website, um, it, it will not happen because uh, always the Android operating system will go and look at Google Play. Uh, in terms of the new updates, so if you want to do that, then you will have to put your application onto Google Play, and then when you have a new update uploaded onto Google Play, it will automatically be detected by the uh, Android device, and it will be downloaded onto the mobile phone. You don't have to manage that at all. Uh, but if you want to do it through your institutional website, it's a manual process. Unfortunately, you will have to send out a notice to the uh, to the users. Asking them to update the application manually. Okay. Uh, there's another question about uh, whether we can add external services like whiteboard video conferencing. Um, well, again, uh, you know, with a little bit of uh, creativity, you can incorporate certain aspects like that. Uh, but you know, it does not support. Uh, out of the box, uh, using the built-in components, uh, you cannot build a whiteboard or you cannot build a uh, video stream. But uh, you know you can work around that. You can actually have you can actually use the video player to stream a uh, video out. You know that's very easily done. Uh, uh, but uh, you know if you want to do that, you know I'd suggest you use a a uh, third-party service such as you know a uh, Google Hangout. Uh, or a uh, YouTube uh, a video cast, uh, you know, where you can uh, where the app, the the, um, uh, the feature is already available, and what you need to do is to incorporate that feature inside your application, and you will be able to do that. In terms of the whiteboard, yes, I mean um, you can build an application where you can draw and you know uh, write and do things like that. However, to to uh, to communicate that to the other parties, you know, that's a whole new technology on its own. Which you know, uh, things like this uh, Adobe Connect and uh, you know, um, uh, Google um, Hangouts and uh, YouTube and things like that have mastered. So my my advice would be to use a third party uh, support if you are going to build something like that. Okay, um, I am aware of the time. We have overrun a little bit, but it seems that all the participants are still hanging on to your talk, Yishan. Um Can I ask one more time whether we have any more questions from you participants? Please type in uh, uh, in the chat box, and then Yishan can answer you. If not, 
I would like to uh, bring this to a close of the conference. It has been very useful, and uh, I thank you very much, Yishan, for giving us a very uh, concise and very precise um, talk about how we can sort of think about developing apps using a very simple tool that you have. Uh, interested people may be um, thinking about going to attend your real workshop, which I suppose would be a lot longer than today, and learn about the tricks of how to develop such apps themselves. So um, uh, I'd like here to call it a close. And again, please all join me in thanking you, Yishen, for the very inspiring and interesting talk, Yishen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And uh, thank you thank all. Thank you very thank much, you Ethan. Thank you. And I uh, hope you will enjoy uh, developing applications on the App Inventor platform. We Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your participation. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you all.